who has served, interestingly enough, on both the boards of both, actually all three organizations, the Maryland Committee for Children and Friends of the Family, on which he was not only a board member, but also the president for a number of years, and now uh, a board member of Maryland Family Network, Scott Phillips, a longtime friend of families, generally in Maryland. And uh, he is going to introduce uh, Brian Sanders to us. So, Scott. policies, 
and funding to support healing and recovery for children and youth who have experienced trauma with an emphasis on increasing access to evidence-based interventions. His empathy for young children, especially those who have suffered from neglect and abuse, and his expertise in system reform make Commissioner Samuels a wonderful choice to deliver the third annual Scolding Lecture. One of the things that I thought, which was not on my notes, and he may have to share a little bit about his personal experience, I understand Mr. Samuels also attended a residential school. It sounded like it was a precursor to maybe a charter school. Um, our experiences in life develop us and create our passion. My sense is Mr. Samuels has done just that. So without further ado, Mr. Bryson. how the traffic is going to flow between here and D.C. is um, always a guess, and uh, we guessed wrong this time. Uh, but it's a really unique opportunity to speak to you. Um, I, I know we have uh, the balance of an hour or so, so I'm going to try to keep my formal comments um, to about the next 30 minutes, which will leave another 30 minutes for folks to ask questions and have a, a, bright, a, a broader dialogue. Um, you know, it's a really unique opportunity to come and speak to you today, um, in part because, um, you know, my path to this position um, wasn't a direct path. Uh, um, and my early professional experience, I think, gives me a perspective that is different than most leaders um, in child welfare. So I spent, um, after I graduated from uh, um, public policy school, um, about five years at a place called the Family Resource Coalition, where we did much of the work around really advocating for family support programs um, throughout the country. Uh, and Maryland's network of family support programs was always a model, um, a shining example of the work that we thought that could be done throughout the country. Uh, we were able to get some federal grants and, and a good number of foundation-supported initiatives. Um, and so I had a chance to really travel the country um, and talk about the importance of family support, to talk about the essential principles around building skills and about uh, empowering families and about seeing young people um, as important contributors um, to their own care. And, and most importantly, um, helping uh, uh, communities see um, families as assets in the community, recognizing that families matter to the outcomes for kids um, and for communities, um, and that they can provide mutual support and guidance um, for one another. And so, and so in those early years, um, I, had a, I had a benefit of working in an environment where the discussion really wasn't about um, um, bad kids and bad families. It was about the broader need that all families have um, for support. Um, and uh, at the end of that five-year period, um, I, I actually had a, um, a boss, a woman by the name of uh, Judy Langford, um, who has gone on to do lots of really great stuff. Uh, but at the time, uh, I was nearing my five-year anniversary in the organization, and, and she announced that she was leaving. Um, and at first, I was, you know, a, a, a little concerned about that. Um, and I was asked to be a part of the, um, the, the committee uh, to, to hire the next CEO. Uh, and not long after that, I decided that maybe I ought to leave too. Um, and so uh, I went out uh, and started an independent consulting firm and spent another eight years out there trying to take the principles of family support um, and really integrate them into community planning processes um, and trying to build the kind of um, community um, um, assets that one needs to really um, promote strong families. Um, and so th that's, that's the grounding that I, that I bring with me. Um, my uh, term uh, as the Child Welfare Director in Illinois was both the worst experience I ever had um, and the best experience I ever had. It had a profound effect on my career, um, but in many, in many respects, 
Um, what I showed up with um, in terms of a skill set and a perspective uh, really was grounded in the work um, of family support. Um, and I had a deep appreciation in that work um, for the importance of research, of the importance of effective practice, um, and, the, and the recognition that evidence comes in many forms. Um, and so I think the presentation that you'll see today uh, and in the conversation <laughs> we'll have afterwards, um, I think you will see an orientation uh, that, that really comes from um, a community and family support perspective, um, but it's also grounded in uh, research um, and, and theory around what we do to get to better outcomes for children and families um, that we serve in public systems. Um, again, I didn't always know that I would do the child welfare thing, and it actually turned out that the first day on the job as a child welfare director was the first day I had worked in child welfare. Um, so I, I had to, um, I had to learn a lot, and I had to learn it pretty fast. Um, uh, but the, the benefit of having the intellectual dexterity of um, being comfortable with administrative data, um, as well as being comfortable in the literature, I think allowed me to accelerate the pace at which um, I could figure out um, where I was at and where I was going, um, and ultimately um, gave me the opportunity to act, also add something new to the, the mix, and I think you'll see a little bit of that in the conversation too. Um, so a better part of what I'll talk about with you is about the, the, the shift that we're trying to make um, at the federal level in the work that we're doing with states. Um, as the commissioner, I'm, I'm actually responsible for two federal bureaus. Um, one bureau is the Children's Bureau, which is where most of the federal resources dedicated to um, child abuse and neglect sit. So there's about seven, seven and a half billion dollars in funds there. Uh, and then we're, I'm also responsible for the Children's, I'm sorry, the Family and Youth Services Bureau. And that bureau um, oversees programs um, specifically um, related to uh, the runaway and homeless youth population. So if you have a runaway and homeless youth shelter in your community, we're probably making a contribution to it. If you have street outreach workers in your community looking for young people and have, trying to connect them to services, the federal government's probably providing those funds, um, uh, as well as some transitional living programs. Uh, for young people who are chronically homeless. We also see, oversee about half of the domestic violence funds. So if you have a domestic violence shelter uh, in your community, uh, we're probably making a contribution to it, um, as, as well as any of the aftercare services. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we oversee about half of the resources around teen pregnancy prevention. Um, that's probably in the newer component of uh, that continuum. Um, but, but what I think is important about uh, the work we're doing in child welfare, the work that we're doing in the runaway and homeless youth population, and the work that we're doing in domestic violence, um, is a recognition um, that in many respects, um, the families that we're talking about in each of those bureaus and each programmatic areas um, share something in common. And what they share in common is the exposure to trauma and violence. Um, and, and whereas they're all separately funded, separate, separately legislated, um, and authorized programs, uh, to the, most days they, they would like to operate independent and disconnected from one another. But when you recognize the common experience of the children and families that they serve, um, it's my belief, and it's been our approach, um, that by working together across those programs, thinking together about what makes a difference in the lives of families that have been exposed to trauma and violence, we think we can accelerate the pace at which we get to better outcomes. We can accelerate the pace at which we find effective interventions. We can accelerate the pace at which our society um, spends fewer dollars on saving children and families from themselves and their community uh, and can spend more of its resources in promoting the health and well-being 
of everybody in every community. Um, so we've tried to take uh, an integrated approach across those programs. Um, and we have framed um, the goal uh, across those programs as one of really promoting the well-being for all children and families that those programs serve. And so for us, um, just talking about issues in child welfare related to permanency is an important conversation, but not the only conversation. Talking about safety and permanency, we think is part of the conversation, not all of the conversation. And the more we learn um, through the biological sciences, the physical sciences, and the neurological sciences about the consequences of exposure to trauma and violence, the more I'm convinced that just focusing on safety and permanency doesn't get us the outcomes that we're hoping for, um, and certainly doesn't get us to the outcomes um, that, that the federal legislation um, articulates as ultimately the goal in each of those programs. Um, now, I have to admit, um, not everybody in child welfare agrees with me. Um, I have to admit uh, that we've spent a good deal of the last three years trying to bring folks around to a perspective that um, a system of child welfare that can get smaller is not in and of itself evidence that the system is producing better outcomes for children and those families. And so if you look at child welfare in this country over the last 15 years, um, really going back to 1997, which is really the sea change point in child welfare. Uh, in 97, Congress passed the Adoptions and Safe Families Act. Um, and probably the single most important um, component um, of the Adoptions and Safe Families Act uh, is that it actually articulated that um, child welfare systems at the state and county level um, have an obligation to both of its clients. That it has an obligation to all of the families that it comes into contact with in both protecting their rights and facilitating their health and well-being. Um, but it also articulated an obligation to the child's right. And so it included language that said that any child in the foster care system who is in the system of out-of-home care for 15 out of 22 months had a right to a determination of their best interest. They had a right to know whether they were going to go back home to their biological family or the state was going to begin to take action to terminate parental rights so that we could find a permanent solution for that child. Um, that's a sea change. That's a really big deal. Now, it's done in the context of a system that had seen dramatic growth over the prior 20 years. If you look at the growth in the child welfare population from 1988 to 1999, the system doubled in size. Um, well over um, 550,000 children in the foster care system. And a big part of the growth in that population in that time was really re related to both the crack cocaine epidemic in many of our large cities, but also the belief um, that we were a society that was somehow now producing these um, this generation of mass murderers of some site that we ought to all be afraid of and that we ought to try to find those children and get them away from their bad circumstances as quickly as possible because if we didn't, they would rape and pillage um, for many generations to come. So there was this belief that we had to do something, that we were in a moment of urgency, that something different had to be done and that difference was taking kids away from their, their families and placing them in foster care. Uh, but states without a, a, um, a timeline, without a time requirement, um, uh, simply deferred 
the right of the parent. So a, a, a child would be removed from their parents' child welfare system, typically within 72 hours, has to go into a court of law and demonstrate to a judge that it had sufficient reason to remove that child. If the judge approved that decision, then the judge also had an obligation to spell out the steps that the parents had to take in order to re receive their children back and to be able to go back to uh, uh, um, moving down a path of healthy development. Um, and typically the judge would give the family six months to fix their problems and to come back and demonstrate progress. Uh, but without a timeline, with, without an expectation that at some point um, we had to make a hard decision, families that didn't meet those expectations would come back into the court in six months and they'd be given another six months. And then they'd be given another six months. And then they'd be given another six months. Uh, and so the law said at, at some point the child's right to a safe and permanent solution could be equated with the right of the parent. Now, many of us may not agree completely with that logic and may not have thought that it was applied fairly in many instances, and that's a conversation I'm glad to have. Uh, but I, I make the point about ASFA because um, that law is really the law um, that focused the child welfare system on achieving greater rates of permanency, getting to a permanent solution. Now, that legislation also articulated a goal of well-being. It, it, it really did. Um, but because of the skyrocketing growth in the child welfare system, um, the, the focus on permanency um, received the lion's share of the attention, and the focus on well-being um, did not. And so, you know, my experience, my position, my argument um, is that the system has seen pretty significant declines in the population. Um, the child welfare system is probably about 35% smaller than it was in 97. Um, that in many states, like mine, Illinois, um, child, the child welfare system is 50 or 60% smaller than it was at that time. And so our question has been, and ultimately our commitment has been one of saying, okay, at some point, the system gets to a place where we have right-sized it, we figured out who ought to be there and who ought not to be there. But at some point, we ought to start having the conversation about child and family well-being, too. At some point, it ought to matter whether what we're doing makes a child and a family better after we've been in their life. And that's really the work that we're trying to do. We're trying to get folks to accept the fact that they've developed good skills and competencies around safety and permanence, um, but the journey's not over, the work is not done, and the focus ought to be now on integrating a perspective of well-being into all parts of the work. Um, uh, I, I think it was uh, um, something of, of, uh, of a logical conclusion, but in almost every place in the Adoptions and Safe Families Act, it says safety, permanency, and well-being. And I think for many years, the field came to think about those things as a sequence. First you do per safety, then you do permanence, and then you do well-being. And, and I think that that was a genuine belief by very committed individuals trying to figure out how to implement the policy. That, in many respects, came to be understood as first you do safety, then you do permanence, and then well-being follows. Um, it came to be believed that just achieving permanence 
was equivalent to achieving well-being. That just by getting that child to a permanent solution, you put them on a path to well-being. But we know a lot from intervention science, and we know a lot from the emerging neuroscience that would clearly um, indicate that being exposed to toxic stress, Jack Shonkoff's word, or being exposed um, to trauma, Bruce Perry's word, um, just taking a child out of a toxic environment, just telling a parent, getting a parent to a point where they're no longer physically or emotionally abusing or neglecting a child isn't the same as promoting well-being. Just as in the family support movement, um, making sure a family had no problems isn't the same as a family that has the capacity to care and, and support and promote the well-being of all members of the family. And so when you begin to look at the science and the literature around what happens to a child that grows up in a stress, um, uh, a high stress family, uh, even if there isn't physical or sexual abuse, just the stress alone affects the development of that child's brain. It affects the way in which that body self-regulates. It affects that child's processing of information. Uh, we, we, know, we know more today than ever before about the effects of maltreatment. Uh, and, and in many respects, uh, it's contrary to many of the assumptions that the child welfare system is built on. But today, we have a different set of findings than we had 10 or 15 years ago. And we think that those findings ought to help direct our efforts to integrate a well-being perspective into all of the work that happens uh, in child welfare. So that we're not doing one thing, then the next thing, then the next thing, but we're thinking from the beginning that our obligation, our goal, is to promote well-being. Sometimes that happens by allowing that child and that family to stay in the home and wrapping services around them. Sometimes that means briefly removing that child from the home, helping that, that, that family begin to make progress, placing the child back in the home, but not assuming that progress is the same as an outcome. And thinking about integrating a child and a family in a nestled environment where you continue to provide the kind of support that leads to positive outcomes. Everything that we know um, from the brain science um, suggests that there is a great deal of neuroplasticity. There is a lot of shifting and changing that occurs in the, in the brain over the first 20 or 25 years of life. Uh, there are some peak periods between, the five, between 3 and 5 years old and somewhere between 15 and 20 years old. Um, but the brain is constantly being shaped, and it's constantly being shaped by the environment. You also have the really cool contributions of things like epigenetics. Epigenetics is really um, the study of DNA, but it's the study of DNA in the context of environment. Um, so most of us know enough about DNA to know that we all have it. <laughs> we know enough about DNA to know um, if we commit a crime, um, that folks can find us. <laughs> but one of the mistakes that we ha we've made in our understanding of DNA is that your DNA is embedded in you before you're born, and it stays the way it is well after you're born. And epigenetics has proved that that's not true, that there is actually a physiological, biological, and neurological process that goes on while you exist in this world that shapes your DNA. And one of the things that they found is, for example, children who grow up in high-stress environments have their particular DNA shaped in a way that accelerates the aging process. 
Telomeres is a term that is connected to one of the functions um, in the DNA molecule. And what we know is children who are expo exposed to stress of all kinds um, see those telomeres erode over time. And the end result of that is we accelerate the growth process. So in many instances, somebody who biologically may have confronted heart disease in the age of 70, their clock gets sped up so that they, they're, they're more susceptible to having that same disease, but having it 10 or 15 years earlier. Um, they talk a lot in epigenetics about gene expression, that it shows up, you show up with a set of genes. But depending on your environment, they express themselves differently. Um, and if we put that in a child welfare context, um, we know just picking a child up from a stressful environment and putting them in a less stressful environment doesn't in and of, its shape, in and of itself reshape any of what's occurred prior to that. Um, and as much shaping that occurs prior to removing them from an abusive situation, the data suggests that as much, if not more, shaping has to occur to move them back to a normal range of functioning. Um, and so again, um, uh, some have described uh, what I've just described as toxic stress or trauma. It's, so it's been described as interpersonal trauma. Sometimes it's described as complex trauma. Sometimes it's, descri it's described um, as developmental trauma. Um, but but it, it, is, it is essentially um, um, traumatic events that occur um, within a caregiving environment. Uh, and it's traumatic experience that don't happen once, but that happen on an ongoing basis. Um, and what we know from that is that it usually leads to exposures to other kinds of traumatic experiences. Um, and that for some children, um, those experiences um, shape their brains in ways that then encourage maladaptive coping strategies with all of that stuff. And it's those maladaptive coping strategies that the body determines works in order for the purposes of surviving a stressful circumstance that then becomes the children and the challenges that we have. And what's really important about the, the stress component of this work um, is that we often think, well, Surely, sexual abuse is the worst abuse. And then, physical abuse must be almost as bad, but not quite as bad. And then, neglect is bad, but it's not as bad as physical abuse. And, and since it's not as bad as physical abuse, it's certainly not as bad as sexual abuse. And so, it's reasonable to assume that sexually abused children are certainly the worst off. And physically abused 14-year-old boys must clearly be better off than those who have been physically abused or sexually abused much earlier in life. Um, and everything I've told you about the emerging sciences around brain and stress and trauma suggests that that is no longer a reasonable assumption. And that getting young people who have been exposed to neglect for the better part of their lives, getting them to a positive outcome, getting them to well-being, is as a big a challenge, if not a bigger challenge, than a child who was exposed to abuse in a limited period of their time, not across multiple developmental stages, and not across multiple types of abuse. Because one of the things you find with neglect is it's not one abuse. It is a series of lower threshold, but a series of abuses that happen over a much longer period of time. and so. The, the coping with that dynamic over time simply embeds the response system even more strongly about how they cope with it. Um, and, and what makes all of this stuff even more complicated is even though the science is pretty certain about the mechanisms that are being changed and producing the bad results, um, the bad results typically don't happen universally. So you could take four kids 
expose them to exactly the same level of stress, and the way in which their genes express themselves, and the maladaptive coping strategies that their bodies choose can be four different ways. And so you have four different kids who show up, all exposed to the same stuff, but expressing them in different ways. And so all of that um, becomes part of the conversation if we want to have a conversation using science as best we can to talk about how we get better outcomes for children and families in foster care. So there are a lot of folks for a long time who were concerned about the number of African American children who were removed from their, their parents and placed into foster care. Disproportionality has been something that we've talked about a lot. Um, uh, and there are a lot of folks that have argued that we ought to do more in the homes, right, so that we don't have to remove children. Uh, but, but think about it. It makes sense to do more in the home if you change the home environment that the child is growing up in, right? Um, to do more in the home but not change the environment and the circumstances, the science would suggest, doesn't get you to a better outcome for that child, doesn't promote that child's well-being. So we're completely agnostic as to where you do this work. <laughs> but we think it's really important that we begin to do this work. Um, and so we have tried to use the, all of the discretionary dollars that Congress gives us um, and every piece of legislation that somebody asks for comment on um, and the bully pulpit um, to try to get the field to recognize the fundamental challenges that the science presents to the way the child welfare system is organized uh, and to begin to integrate as best we can with our limited resources the new experiences, the new information, the new science that we have available to us. And so that, that's, that's really been the work. That's really been the strategy. Um, and that it, and it is fair to say that it is a significant challenge. Um, but we've done some really cool stuff, and I'm, I'm glad to talk about some of the cool stuff. But let me make one other point, and then I think I'll open it up for discussion, um, and we can talk about the cool stuff as the questions come around. Um, and so, 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 so folks ask me, so, so if I was going to look for well-being, how, how would I know it when I saw it, right? Um, and the, the way we talk about it um, is we talk about it in the context of some of the critical domains that we know are impacted by stress, toxic stress, and trauma, right? And so um, the, the, the literature makes clear that, that Part of what makes a difference between the children who come through adversity and are okay versus those that really struggle um, is that creation of a sense of self-efficacy. That, that children who go through each of the developmental stages that every child goes through, whether you're abused and neglected, you still need to develop the competencies that are required in each of those developmental stages. And where you see young people struggle, you often see they struggle because they don't have a level of efficacy around the essential competencies that a child needs to be a child of three, and a child of seven, and a child of 14, and in many instances, a child of 21, right? So thinking developmentally, around the skills and competencies are really important. Now, that, that doesn't suggest that a child welfare system should keep a child in care through all of those developmental stages. But we ought to be thinking about our intervention as developmentally critical. Uh, 
We also know the impact that trauma and violence has on, on self-image. We know the impact that it has on emotional regulation. Uh, and more critically, we also know more today than ever before about the impact of toxic stress and trauma on a child and adult's ability to engage in healthy relationships. And the science actually takes us further down the path from thinking that if we just put that child in front of a caring adult, that everything will be fine, to a recognition that there's actually an interaction between the adult and the child that actually dictates whether things will be fine. We also know today more than ever before that emotional regulation is intimately tied to intimate relationships. That if you don't have the ability to self-regulate, if you don't have the ability to concentrate, if you don't have empathy, meaning you don't have the ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and see the world from their perspective, then you have a really difficult time engaging in a mutually reinforcing and positive relationship. And yet in child welfare, we run children from person to person to person to person to person to person. To person. And we expect in every instance, regardless of how much effort we put in to the person to person to person to person to person to person transition, that every child and every adult should connect with one another, they should attach to one another, we should get a great outcome from every single one of them. <laughs> and, and, and so there, there, really is, there, there really is a value in talking about what we mean by well-being. And, and we think um, we ought to think about it broadly. Um, we can talk about it in terms of essential domains that folks would like to talk about it that way. Um, we can talk about it as essential competencies across age groups. We can do it that way too. Um, but, but the challenge has sometimes the, the challenge that people bring back to me is, well, how do you define it? And if you can't define it, how can you measure it? And if you can't measure it, why are you asking me to do it? Um, and the easy answer is, um, that uh, 15 years ago when we decided we were going to focus on permanency, we had no idea 15 years ago that we would be doing today what we're doing to get as many children as we are to permanence. So we didn't have to know everything about permanence to begin to go down the road of moving children to permanence. And as I stand here today, I see no reason why we have to wait until we know everything <coughs> about every mechanism in the brain to begin the process of moving a system towards recognizing that it can be therapeutic in its intervention in a way that promotes well-being at the same time that one pursues safety and permanence. So I'm actually going to stop there and hopefully um, have said things that are provocative enough <laughs> Uh, that people will want to debate them um, or at least discuss them. So I'll stop there and take some questions. Thank you. 
Today we understand that stress is not just an uncomfortable feeling, but stress has a profound effect on uh, a person's longevity, on chronic illness, uh, and it is intergenerationally transmitted through the mechanisms that uh, you spoke about. I think it makes everything that you said even more compelling, that understanding that we have in terms of what we need to do and why early childhood is absolutely central. So thank you. I it was fabulous. So just one thing to point out on this slide here. Um, this is a slide of data that comes from a study called the National Study of Child and Adolescent Well-Being in SCAR. Um, and one of the things that it looks at are risk factors in families that come into contact with the foster care system. And so this is a slide here that just looks at some of the challenges that families bring with them to the system. And so, um, you know, we've got the percentages below the bottom here, but if you look at a history of domestic violence against the caregiver. Uh, the orange bars are children who we removed from the home, and the blue bars are for children that we left in the home and provided services in the home. So as you can see, domestic violence is pretty prevalent um, within uh, these families at about 30%, and not a big difference between the children who got removed and the children who remained at home in terms of exposure. Um, a history of their own abuse and neglect, the, the intergenerational dynamic of trauma and violence is present uh, in these households. Uh, the caregiver uh, uh, having a serious mental illness um, is a critical component of our understanding of these families. Domestic violence <coughs> against the caregiver being active as opposed to a history. Um, having active substance abuse, which we tend to give a lot of attention to, don't give much attention to the other stresses that exist in these families. Um, uh, but, but as you can see, these are highly stressed, highly challenged families. Um, uh, looking at some of the other important risk factors that one would look at from a family support perspective. Um, as you can see, that first one uh, talks about the prior reports for maltreatment. Um, and you can see that number goes out to almost over 70% of the families that we remove have been uh, reported for maltreatment in the past. Uh, the reason why we included that was just to make the point that usually this is not a one-time event that occurs when a family comes into contact with foster care. It's multiple contacts. Sometimes it leads to a removal, sometimes it doesn't. But look at some of the other stresses that are in these families. High stress for families, well over 50%, right? Low social support, trouble paying basic bills, having a mental health, having the child have a mental health or special need. The primary care provider, the caregiver, not having good parenting skills. These are all of the basic components that we think well-functioning families have, and these are the stressors that families bring with them to the foster care system. And, and so even though we go in there looking for abuse and neglect, what we find is a lot of toxic stress. And, and reshaping our thinking to think about how we address the nature of toxic stress for the purpose of getting to well-being issues for children is really critical. It also makes the point that if the family comes into contact with you, because of their substance abuse, right? Down here. And you have the benefit of being able to intervene and address their substance abuse. In all likelihood, that alone doesn't put that family in the position of being able to promote the well-being of the children that are in the home. That those are just two components of the stressors that exist in that household. And so if our goal is to get to better outcomes for children and their families, to put families on the path of supporting their children's healthy development, thinking about what some of the other stressors are and intervening on those stressors um, is probably really important.
Next question. that relationship is. So we can argue the association between poverty and coming to the attention of the child welfare system. We can't argue um, that one causes the other. But again, if you look at this one, um, and you look at that fifth one, you know, you could think about this two ways, right? Um, which is that, uh, you know, in, in many instances here, um, the, the problems that a particular family has um, is not all of these, right? So they're not being, um, they don't have the cascading effect of all of these problems at the same time, but at least looking at all of those problems are ultimately a component to thinking about how to get to a better outcome. All of what we know about the nature of abuse and neglect is that there is no income for which abuse and neglect doesn't occur. So rich people beat their kids just as much as poor people do. Um, and it would be a mistake for anybody to think otherwise. There's no proof that, that's, that, 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 that anything other than that exists. Um, what is often different is that rich folks don't come into contact with the system as often as poor folks do. And the more exposure you have to the system, the greater is the likelihood that you get caught up in the system. Um, but you know, but I, I want to be clear about you know, abuse and neglect um, is pretty universal across um, all income categories. Yes. Um, I'm not sure Obviously, cost benefit analysis to uh, 
the child staying in the family as opposed to being part of the system. So I guess my question is, um, in terms of moving forward, um, does this stress, and considering the stress once they're part of the system, change what it means to be a foster care, uh, be providing foster care, be an adopted parent, um, and what you look for in that if you're high, higher in your standards of well-being? So yes, it should change the way um, foster care is organized and the points of emphasis. Um, and one example um, is really thinking about using screening and assessment in a different way in the foster care system. Um, today, we typically um, don't use a validated instrument for screening and assessing, so we have very little ab ability to say with confidence uh, what the challenges are that families have. Two, we typically only screen and assess the children that we remove from the household. We do very little screening and assessing for children that are in the household, right? Um, and when we do screening and assessment, um, we typically are using it um, solely for the purposes of determining whether there's a mental health diagnosis or not. And what we know from the prior discussion around toxic stress, trauma, and all of those experiences is that uh, children develop many symptoms that are consistent with complex trauma. But those problems don't rise to the level of a mental health diagnosis. And so for many children, they're struggling with issues that go unaddressed because we can't call what problems they have a diagnosis. That's, and the second problem we have is that often the diagnosis that we're giving children is inaccurate in part because most diagnostic instruments were developed for adults and not children. Most diagnostic instruments were developed on the assumption that there was nothing co-occurring, so they do a pure analysis of a particular diagnosis and not multiple challenges. And what you see in children who've been exposed to toxic stress and trauma are complex symptoms that sometimes are called ADHD, sometimes called conduct disorder, con sometimes called depression, sometimes con called anxiety, sometimes called bipolar, sometimes called PTSD. But you could take the symptoms in all of the diagnoses that I just described and go to the trauma literature and it would list the exact same list as evidence of showing complex trauma and not any one of these diseases. And so when we intervene, and we intervene based on an assumption that it is a mental health diagnosis like ADHD, that then charts the course of the intervention. If we decide, no, it's not ADHD, it's really depression, then that charts the course of the intervention. If it turns out that in both of these instances what you're seeing is complex trauma, neither of the approaches that are evidence-based for those two interventions would make a difference in the life of that child. So understanding the interplay between the emotional impact of trauma and violence across developmental stages means that we have to think about screening and assessment in a different way. A one-time screen of you're either you're mentally ill or you're not. Um, if I showed you any of the developmental charts, kids get more complex the older they get. So if you enter when you're three, I screen you at three, you don't have a problem. I'm not done. So you're not done. And so we have to think about screening more <coughs> from the level of thinking about what are the clinical issues that arise for a child who's been exposed to toxic stress and trauma.
Uh, and so what we're looking for are particular symptoms that we can intervene on appropriate given their trauma history. Um, we also have to think about functional assessment. We ought to think about, is Johnny or Jane getting better over time? And so you've got to have an instrument that allows you to compare apples to apples over time. Otherwise, we don't know if what we're doing makes a difference because the vast majority of what we do in terms of service delivery has not been evaluated. So we don't know that we're running evidence-based programs every place we stick a child for service. And in light of that, we, we have to have some mechanism for trying to figure out if that service is working. And evaluation would be one way. Another way would simply be to monitor that, that child's functioning over time and determine whether the service is making a difference. Then you have a discussion about what that child or family needs to get to a different result. You don't have to indict the program, you just come to the conclusion that what Johnny's getting is not making a difference and therefore we need to make a mid-course correction to reflect that Johnny's not moving in the right direction. So yes, we think practices around screening and assessment needs to change. We're working very closely with Medicaid on these issues because we think that there are different interpretations of EPSDT and by using early screening and periodic testing, um, we think that we can find um, other ways to intervene. We've been working closely with Medicaid around the issue of diagnosis and whether there's a different way of talking about meeting the needs of children. Um, in Medicaid, typically um, um, in almost every state, in order to gain access to a Medicaid-funded service, you have to have a, a diagnosis of a mental illness. Uh, and, and, and so many in the trauma field have suggested that know that trauma is equally as damning as is a mental health diagnosis and, and requires equal levels of competency in terms of the intervention. Um, that hasn't flown in most states. Uh, but here's the most important point uh, um, from a, the federal perspective, and I had to be in this job to learn it, which is the federal government doesn't require a mental health diagnosis. What the, what the federal government requires is that a child meet the definition of medical necessity. And medical necessity um, um, could easily be used to describe complex problems. So what that requires is the state to go back and to consider whether the state is interested in intervening on issues of complex trauma um, using Medicaid as a vehicle. Because there's nothing as in the federal policy that would prevent a state from doing that. Obviously, it has cost implications. Obviously, it has workforce implications. Uh, but it's important to recognize that that threshold that we've set up called a mental health diagnosis and organizing our screening and assessment around that in a child welfare context doesn't make a whole lot of sense anymore. Um, and so we've made grants just this year. We, we funded 10 states to move towards doing a different approach to screening and assessment. Um, and we'll continue to try to do that in terms of bringing more states on board with rethinking their screening and assessment using um, discretionary funding. Uh, we gave each of those states about 2.5 million um, to rethink their strategy around screening and assessment, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, but this is only one area where, yeah, we think that all of the work around toxic stress in families and trauma in families um, requires a, a different approach than the one we have today. Yeah. looking at how does the system change 
so that it doesn't cause more toxic stress on children that are in it. Not just the programs that are helping them heal, but at the same time as the programs that are trying to help them heal, the stress of being in the child welfare system is enormous for their children, for the child and the family. So can you speak to those kind of variables? Sure. sure. I, you know, um, certainly, certainly we think um, that um, effective interventions are important. Um, but again, we think, we think just about all of the families that come into contact with the foster care system um, have lots of stress in their lives, um, some of which rises to the level uh, of being defined as toxic stress. Um, and then we think that we have to rethink our approach in in-home interventions. But again, I'm not saying that a family with tons of toxic stress in and of itself needs to enter the foster care system to have its issues addressed. So regardless of where we choose to address them, we think changing our approach um, across screening and assessments critical, but also around workforce issues of training investigators to handle children in a trauma-informed way if they're gonna make a removal, um, to think about families as having strengths and assets in doing that intervention and determining whether there are sufficient assets to justify or to mitigate the, the risk. So instead of going into a home and only listen, looking for risk, we ought to be looking for risks and strengths and using that as a determination of whether that child can be sustained in the home. And certainly in the instance where we have to remove children from their home, dealing with the consequences of the removal is a central component um, to, a, to a child welfare's ability uh, to, to really uh, be effective. Um, that said, I think it's Im important um, to say um, that um, lots of children and families uh, who come into contact with the foster care system have been exposed to traumas. Not all of those children or families demonstrate trauma symptoms. And we ought to be intervening where we have evidence that an intervention is necessary and appropriate. And what I'm arguing for is simply intervening in a way where we intervene on a continuum. Instead of picking a point on a continuum and saying, you have to be on this side or that side of the line in order to intervene. So, so that would be our argument. And then the other thing, was, thing I would say is um, uh, there increasingly states are removing fewer children. So this past year, um, states took into out-of-home care fewer children than they have in the last 20 years. Some of you think that's great. And some of you think, boy, what does that mean? Right? Uh, but we can have that conversation over a beer or a drink or a glass of wine, and we'll have it here. But, but, my, but my, my, point, my point would be this. Um, uh, I think that there are many instances where a removal from a family circumstance is the right thing to do and the best thing to do. The child actually gets better when that removal happens. Um, there are instances where the benefit of the removal is far less than the cost associated with it um, and that we have to build systems that can make those distinctions. Um, but I, I'm not going to accept as a uh, on principle um, that it is always better to serve children and families in the home. There are circumstances where, there, where, where it's simply not appropriate. Uh, it also depends on which system you're operating, right? So most folks think about the child welfare system as one system. Um, it is, at the very least, 52 systems. Every state runs its own foster care system plus Puerto Rico and D.C. And if you happen to live in a state where you have a, um, a county-run system, then you have as many systems as you have counties in those states. Um, and that's because federal law represents about 50% of the operating standards in a child welfare system, and the rest is defined at the state level. So for example, we don't tell states at the federal level what abuse is, in terms of what's the definition of physical abuse, sexual abuse, or neglect, states define that. 
We don't set the standards of when a family reaches a point where a child should be removed or not removed. We don't set the standard for how you train your social workers. We don't set the standard for how you choose to, what, what the qualifications are to be a caseworker. We don't define what good fostering parenting looks like. States do. So it's often thought that it's the federal government that makes all of these decisions, and if a state's not doing it, then that's evidence that the federal government's not making the state do it. States make a lot of these decisions, and as a consequence of that, each state is different. Um, and so we can, I can talk in these broad terms about what families ought to come in and not come in, but that will vary dramatically depending on what state you're in. Illinois is a state that had a very low removal level, meaning by the time I took over the system, uh, we were taking into out-of-home care uh, fewer than 8,000 families a year, um, which may sound like a lot, but in, in a Illinois, given the size of it, that's a very low removal rate. There are other states that have high removal rates. Minnesota, um, they have a high removal rate. Um, L.A. County has a very high removal rate. L.A. County is going out and investigating 95% of all calls. Um, um, and has a removal rate of almost 80%. Now, you compare that, you can say, LA has a high removal rate, um, uh, Minnesota has a high removal rate, um, but in Minnesota, you also have very short lengths of stay. So they tend to remove and then move the child back to the family in very short time periods when they have determined that the child can safely remain um, at home. Uh, LA um, has a much longer length of stay. So having a high removal rate and a longer length of stay means that their system stays at a certain size and doesn't have the potential to get smaller until they either bring in fewer families or find an appropriate way to reduce the length of stop time that families um, uh, remain involved. So each of these systems are different and they've got to be tweaked um, to reflect both federal and state law, um, as well as the operating procedures um, that exist in any system. So it looks like we probably have time for one more question. Another question? Thank you. Um, I know you don't have a lot to say about the Head Start or early Head Start funding or child care and development fund or race to the top of the Green Challenge funding, but I'd be very interested to hear you talk about what you'd like to see those programs, those funding sure. streams do. Um, for children at risk of coming into the, the child welfare system? It's a, it's a, it's a, great, it's a great question. Um, so, uh, we, we think the, the, the early education component um, has, a, has a natural fit uh, uh, in child welfare uh, if, if you're willing to do a little bit of work. Um, we, we introduced in Illinois, when I was the child welfare director, uh, a comprehensive assessment for every child entering out of home care uh, within the first 45 days. And we screen and assess for physical, mental health, and trauma. Uh, in those 45 days, we also interview the biological family. We also interview the caregiver the child is placed with. Uh, and one of the uh, really startling uh, um, pieces of the data that came out of that screening and assessment was that um, is that 70% 70, 70 of three-year-olds and 50% of five-year-olds who came into contact in the Illinois system had not been enrolled in an early education program. So the, the very programs that are organized to provide a low-stress environment, promote social and emotional development, to promote cognitive development, to relieve the stress in households, all of the basic 
elements of an early childhood system and program um, were being uh, missed by the families that would have benefited the greatest from having connections to them. And so we worked really um, closely with the early childhood community to implement a policy that said that any child three to five years old um, who enters out of home care ought to be enrolled in early education. Um, people thought that that would be really difficult to do and that we'd get a lot of pushback and that the logistics of getting kids in and out of those programs uh, would be too cumbersome and, and I can tell you today um, that at least for the children in out-of-home care in, in Illinois, 90% of the three to five-year-olds are enrolled in early education um, uh, for all the reasons I, I described. And we've made discretionary grants the last three funding cycles to states to encourage them to adopt the same policy. And so we gave them money to work on a collaborative um, relationships with the early childhood community. So we gave them about 250,000 each year for two years to think through. So um, where, where are the resources? How do we collaborate? What policies and procedures have to be put in place to have that happen? Um, had, I, had I remained in Illinois, I would have taken the same approach to um, a policy related to children who we left at home but were providing services. I would have strongly encouraged, aggressively encouraged, uh, moving those children uh, into early education too. So I, th I think it's a critical component. Um, one of the, cons one of, uh, we, so with the race to the top and early learning, um, we've been at the table with those folks, um, um, trying to keep at the forefront of their discussions the social and emotional development of, of children as we try to race them to the top. We, we, we want them to show up with, um, uh, the, all of the competencies that it takes um, to learn uh, uh, in a consistent and successful way. And we think that's as, as social and emotional as it is cognitive and physical. Um, and, and people are receptive to it. Um, the, the, the challenge is always that um, folks really want to do things that they can measure and they wanted things that they could measure easily. And the social and emotional aspects of early life um, are more difficult to measure, uh, and therefore that represents often a barrier to people fully embracing that opportunity for children who are on the, on the most at-risk end. But again, if you think about at-risk on a continuum, um, those social and emotional dynamics aren't limited to just the children and families that come into the foster care system or come into contact with foster care. There's a much wider range where toxic stress, low economic circumstances drive the development of children and thinking about the social and emotional aspects across that spectrum of young people um, is critical. One of the real concerns we have um, around Part C is that while foster care is required to have all zero to two year olds screened through Part C, most Part C screening instruments don't focus on the social and emotional aspects of development. And so you have a lot of children who come into contact with the foster care system that screen out of Part C, not because they're not needy, because the instruments that they're using um, aren't sensitive enough to capture the critical domains of children who've been exposed to toxic stress and trauma. And so, um, you know, what we're hoping in the future is those same grants that we were using to support collaboration between early childhood and child welfare, um, that we can open that door up a little wider and, and offer the opportunity to have it be Part C in child welfare also, to see if we can get some good examples of Part C programs that have more sensitive instruments and can open up a, a broader array of referral services that might be able to address some of the issues that high-stress families and high-stress children uh, bring with them. 
So, 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 the, so the good news is we're at the table, right? Um, the, 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 the less than great news is that um, the, the issues that our families bring with them tend to be seen as just beyond the reach of simple, straightforward measurement and accountability mechanisms. And so rather than doing the work of figuring that stuff out, things are moving so fast um, that that range of kids and families just don't end up getting included in what gets rolled out. Uh, and ultimately, I think we'll find that, that that was a missed opportunity. While I certainly recognize um, the limited time that any administration believes it has, and the belief that they need to go forward as aggressively as they can. So we're at the table, we're trying to deal with, with um, the early childhood issues, we're trying to bring some new information and enthusiasm. Uh, we often, you often hope that if you bring a little bit of money, you get to play in the game a little bit more. But the reality is, the money I'm bringing and the money they got, nah, yeah, uh, isn't that close. But, but we think all of those things are really critical. So let me close by saying this, because um, uh, it's often been worried that um, when, when, I, when I talk about um, toxic stress um, and I talk about uh, trauma for children, it's, it's off, there's often a concern that, that I don't say family as many times as I say children. And, and that leads people to believe that, that we don't think that families um, need support, um, at, um, which um, is antithetical to, to my entire uh, um, uh, early professional life. But, but I, I, point, I point out that uh, this slide here, which are, um, when we talk about some of the interventions that we're now supporting states in the implementation of through the 4E waivers, through the regional partnership grants that we're making, through the support of housing and child welfare initiative that we're funding. So, um, um, and I show you this list down the middle, which are evidence-based interventions by age group. Uh, and the ones that are highlighted in orange are the ones that all have a family component to them. So, so I may not use equal amounts of child, youth, and family language, but all of the interventions that we're talking about have the parents as an essential element of the healing and recovery process. Um, and that often it's multi-generational healing and recovery that's going on with our families. Uh, and we think it's an essential element to getting to well-being for all children and all families um, who come into contact uh, with the foster care system. So, so thanks for the opportunity to speak to you, and um, I certainly welcome your, your questions and comments.